We've got Jeff Bezos, Jessica Alba, Mark Cuban, Ray Dalio, Ray Kurzweil, Craig Venter. I mean, the, the breadth is just, it is nuts. And yeah, it's, it's, it's super impressive. The, the I mean, the, 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 the path to getting to those people took many, many years. And it's, it's probably not a good idea for people to try to cold call or reach out to people like that. I mean, we certainly weren't getting those people on day one. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Elliot Biznow and Jeff Rosenthal, welcome to Flow Research Collective Radio. It's great to have you both here. Stephen and I have been looking forward to this. It's going to be fun. Here we go. So, so the new book, which is absolutely phenomenal, we're going to be talking a lot about it. It's got the great title, Make No Small Plans, Lessons on Thinking Big, Chasing Dreams, and Building Community. Stephen and I have both read it. We both loved it. We've been raving about it. Um, there's a quote in that book at the beginning in the intro that says the strength of our organization stems not from its four founders, but from the hands of the remarkable community connected by a common insatiable desire to create, to share, and to nourish their best selves. Uh, and before we even describe what Summit is and how you both ended up building it, um, I would love to hear some things top of mind that contributed to Summit creating such an incredible and rare community and you know what you both uh, attribute that to jeff you want to take it away i i think that you know um assuming some cursory knowledge of summit being you know a global, global community of entrepreneurs and innovators um gathered together at flagship events and all over the world for the past decade plus um as well as powder mountain need in utah and other manifestations 13 years on since founding it um I think that, you know, it was an idea that, that came at the right time. And I think um, generationally, there's these communities that come together that, you know, are the heart and soul of a particular discipline or art form or industry. Um, and I think that, you know, in the 2010s, um, all of the silos were ready to break together, you know, in, in an interdisciplinary fashion where they were valuable for one another. Um, in a way that I don't think was uh, necessarily true 10 years prior. Um, and we also had the good fortune of having some, you know, inspiration from conferences like TED and, you know, music festivals and parties. Um, and so, you know, the idea that, you know, thought leadership events could both be fun and engaging um, and really, you know, inspirational and, and high level, um, we, you know, and that of course extended to many other you know, areas of interest and focus and, and um, you know, in, in the way that we produce flagship events. But um, yeah, I, 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 I guess where we don't take as much credit is that, you know, I think we were the first in, uh, at, at a time where that, that hadn't happened yet. These worlds hadn't collided and, and started interacting. Do you give all I'd the credit to... to timing, Jeff? This is, I don't believe this. <laughs> well, there, uh, there certainly was, you know, an emergent era Stephen, you know, after the iPhone launch, you, you had this platform where suddenly any person starting in right, right, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, basically for the first time ever, anyone could create an app, right? Anyone could cheaply and quickly build a business. And you, you know, the millennial generation, like really rocketed up there, right? That that's when they started building. And, you know, like when I dropped out of college, I was the first person in the history of my high school to ever drop out of college. And when I started my first business, I didn't even know that you could raise money for a business. I didn't even know there was such thing as venture capital, right? Because those things were kind of pre-2008. And 
you have this era, right, where all these incredible companies that we know today were all started in this window from like 2006 to 2010. And none of those people got invited to anything. They didn't get invited to any conferences. They didn't get invited to any gatherings. There's, there's a good analogy. Uh, imagine the 10,000 islands in Florida, and you know there's 10,000 islands, but you can't see any of them because there's no elevation. And so on your little island, you're all alone. Um, and I think it turned out, you know, to, to your great, great question to open this, that, you know, our idea worked because we needed a community and therefore it was obvious that others needed a community, right? Like we were all completely siloed. We didn't know anybody and these other incredible founders didn't know anybody. And so when it came to timing, I do think there was a lot of luck um, that mm -hmm. we launched Summit in a perfect moment in time. Like you couldn't have launched Summit five years later because there wasn't kind of this desperate group like filled with entrepreneurial energy, but that didn't have any connections. That makes a lot of sense to me. Was there a point, uh, an event, a conversation or whatever, where you, were, where you started to realize that this, the interdisciplinary world that you guys built was gonna be one of the things? Jeff, you wanna take it? Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, as you hear from, from uh, what Elliot was just breaking down, it was very entrepreneurial and business focused. Um, for the first, you know, few, three, four years of Summit. And there was a sprinkling of, uh, you know, the arts and music and food and, and entertainment and government and, you know, and ast well, eight astronauts. I wouldn't say it was a science uh, festival, you know. Um, and I think that the idea that the more diverse the inputs, the more complex and impactful the outputs, the way that I think that this sort of like, you know, um, 10,000 islands of entrepreneurs wanted to better themselves in all these different directions. Um, we are insatiably curious and we were 24, 23 years old when we founded Summit and we all of a sudden had like, you know, not to use an overused phrase, but a tribe of mentors. And we were smart enough to know at, you know, at a basic level, how lucky we were to have all of these incredible guides. So, you know, I think that uh, Summit became more diverse. The experience became more diverse as you know we as we grew up um but but you know when you hear us sort of like say oh it's timing oh it's other people it really is for us it's like we we had this incredible triangulation of goodwill um and yeah we, we i think we're pretty good at gathering people there there was an accidental moment Stephen, on our second event that had 60 people and there were the accidental moment um was that there were three speakers there tim ferris Scott Harrison from Charity Water, Tim Ferriss from 4-Hour Workweek, Scott Harrison from Charity Water, and Blake Mykoski from Tom Shoes. And they were there as attendees, also speakers. But that was uh, the first merging of different worlds at Summit, um, where suddenly people building tech businesses were listening for really the first time ever um, to a, a very relatable story uh, from Scott Harrison, who was running a, a charity serving, you know, attempting to serve millions of people with clean water, or for the first time seeing one of the earliest businesses that, you know, attempted to have a double bottom line with Tom Shoes, right? For everyone you buy as the customer, we're giving something. And then hearing, you know, for the first time, I think for almost all these 60 attendees, the first time ever hearing, hearing a life hacker in Tim Ferriss, right? Like so many of us, you know, grew up with the uh, retire, uh, you know, in your 60s, and it's all about, you know, profit focused businesses and making money. And then suddenly, it's like, life is about, you know, giving life is about having a double bottom line, you know, taking weekends off and spending time with the people you love. So, you know, that that has always stood in my mind as like a moment we all latched onto. And from there, as Jeff described, like, we basically sprinted toward that for 12 years, realizing like, if that's what the impact three diverse thinkers can have on a community. Imagine what happens when you exponentially increase the, you know, the diversity of thought. I just want to give people a quick sense of that by doing some name dropping on your, your behalf as well. So you guys had, uh, as creators involved in Summit, we've got Jeff Bezos, Jessica Alba, Mark Cuban, Ray Dalio, Eckhart Tolle, Ramdas, Bill Clinton, Kendrick Lamar, Kobe, 
uh, Ray Kurzweil, Craig Venter. I mean, the, the breath uh, is just, is nuts. And yeah, it's, it's, it's super impressive. The, the I mean, the, 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 the path to getting to those people took many, many years. And it, it's probably not a good idea for people to try to cold call or reach out to people like that. I mean, we certainly weren't getting those people on day one. And when people like, you know, Tim Ferriss or Scott Harrison or Blake Mykoski came, who today are quite famous, you know, Tim Ferriss had just published the four hour work week and Tom's had only given away 10,000 pairs of shoes and Charity Water was literally celebrating their first anniversary. You know, I think today is they're approaching their 15th. So a lot of the people we had became better known later. And, and also as we build relationships and we build trust with the community, the community, our best source of referrals and speakers by far was introductions from people who came to Summit, saw the quality of what we were putting on, built trust with us. And then they would introduce us to other people and say, hey, I think you may like to meet. And you know, that list you you just shared, I think you may like to meet people like that and that they could benefit from what you're doing. So it took a long time to get those people. Let me, uh, just so everybody listening can have a little context of why you guys are on uh, Clarity Search Collective Radio talking to us. First of all, I go way back with both Jeff and Elliot and uh, early on in the flow work, uh, we held one of our first flow events at their Malibu mansion. Uh, way, way back in, I, is that 10 years ago now? Something like that. So there's, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of connection. But the, to, the thing I want to start with is Summit events have gone farther than almost any other event that I can think of, with the possible exception of Burning Man, to try to create group flow at scale and make it really useful. More than, and this I think is more than Burning Man, where the group flow you were creating was very focused on driving forward like social entrepreneurship and those kinds of ideas that were very, very important to you. So can you talk a little bit about that? I know that was there a little bit from the beginning because I remember having conversations with Jeff about group flow 10, 12 years ago at this point, but how did that mature for you? What did you learn all along the way? What were the greatest like flow triggers and what were the greatest group flow blockers? Mm -hmm. All those kinds of flow related questions. Um, I'll start by saying that we are all, uh, I, I don't know for flow state addicts. I don't know if it's, uh, something that we, as soon as junkies we, is the, is, is the appropriate term here. Is that what you say? Okay. Flow um, junkie. Um, yeah. You know, we always, we all bonded in our love for, uh, skiing. Um, you know, all of us played sports our whole lives. We all, you know, um, surf or aspire to surf. Um, uh, and, and I think that, you know, with the way that we, you know, we're finding success in the early days of summit, um, you know, as you start to get on a roll that, that, that metaphor people understand, but to, to connect it to flow, um, and to feel it in different, um, you know, whether it's jujitsu or surfing or, you know, your relationship with your, with your loved ones, um, you know, you can get into this one plus one equals three environment that you don't, you can, you can feel and not think as much. Right. So um, I think that for summit, you know, we did get into a flow where we, we saw the, the, the manifestation of live event, for instance, as this, you know, uh, art of social sculpture, how do you use the people and the place and the narrative and the music and the experiences and peak experience moments and if you know our, our, our flagship events are over three and a half days and they're choose your own adventure, but there's these different times where we'd make sure that people got a particular message or people had a particular experience that you know would stand out ideally for their lives. You know, like we're trying to give people the best musical experiences, the best friends, the best, you know, most insightful conversations where they can really learn or take away uh, meaningful info. I mean, like if you listen to a podcast, you go to a talk take away two things, three things that you remember, I think that's like incredible, you know? Um, so, so for us, we were always thinking about, you know, how do we uh, deepen the arrows? How do we enrich the experience? Um, and, how, and how thoughtful are we with people's time? You know, the more that we respect the fact that these are really exceptional people who are the busiest folks on the planet, they don't have enough time for the people they love and they're gonna come and do your thing. Um, you know, we, we also got this great pattern recognition because we were meeting a thousand entrepreneurs from a thousand different disciplines and seeing what they all needed and, and being able to, and to be able to match both, you know, people and personalities, mentors and mentees, professional services, 
capital to projects, overlapping interests, you know, like we, we just be, you know, and, and I think that, you know, that is the currency that we most seek, frankly, like we get more pleasure out of seeing our friends thrive than we do when we have our own wins, when, you know, and, that, and that's, that's how we're wired. Um, and I think that that's really important if you're going to be a, a, a real community builder and experience creator. One of the chapter titles that I loved, which goes back to what you were emphasizing, Elliot, um, maybe you can speak more to this, was a single connection can be exponential. And I'm curious how you guys saw that exponential wave take place with respect to, as you said, the first event with Tim and Blake, all the way up to Bezos, presidents, you know, and the most kind of well-known uh, people on earth. I think one of the challenges um, with watching online content is while you can learn a lot, it inherently lacks the ability to immediately connect with people around it. You know, there are ways, but when you go to content in person, you know, there's a self-selecting element of the people in that room. And, and when the talk ends, that's really when the work begins. Right, because rather than leaving a talk with some ideas in your head, what actually happens is like we would create a lot of space, sometimes up to 45 minutes after the content sessions. So like the worst thing is, you know, you're in high school, the class ends and you, you, you're running to the next one because like class is starting. And like we would create these like incredibly, uh, like the incredibly spacious uh, events where you would just have time after the sessions to connect with people. And, you know, when you're self-selecting into a talk, whatever the talk is about, and you know that the dozens or hundreds of other people in that talk are searching for the same thing, suddenly that room you're in or that amphitheater, it literally becomes uh, like, it just becomes like a basket of people that you should meet and be friends with. I always thought that Summit, you know, was for all the people you should have been friends with. Right. And then within each individual content session, now there's even more people who are just like everyone in the you know, conversation on prison recidivism is passionate about that. You know, everyone in the, the music talk is, you know, passionate about the music publishing industry. You know, everyone, uh, you know, in, in each of these talks is passionate and they're all connecting. And so, you know, what happens when you make one connection and the reason one connection can be exponential is because you can work simply put as hard as you want 12 hours a day and either be going kind of in the right direction or the wrong direction but one person who can steer you in either the correct direction or can make can open a door that just levels you up like four steps uh, can, can can truly exponentially change your business and we've just seen that over and over and over again so we're we're big believers and like when you come to an event, like the greatest thing you can take away is even a half a dozen relationships where each one has the potential to impact your personal life or your business. One of the things that it's really, this to me, we were talking a little bit before uh, we started about this, but the thing that's clearest to me in reading the book, which uh, I have to second Ryan, uh, Ryan's opinion, it's wonderful, super fun. You keep at every, every whenever you're faced with uh, any kind of question, test for the company, anything like that, your response was always go bigger, go bigger, go bigger. And I, you know, I've seen that Peter Diamandis sort of was, you know, is the incarnation of that. I think I learned it so much from being around him a little bit. That's a hard lesson for a lot of people to learn. A lot of people get scared off by scale. They get scared off, you know, you guys took it all the way to the end to we're going to buy a mountain. And First, at which level, like what level up was the scariest for each of you? You know what I mean? Like which step forward was it and, and why? And how did that become such an instinct for you? Because I know it like it's an automatic habit at this point, but it wasn't always. So I'm curious about that, that process of where like that, that much ferocity sort of became a habit and how it developed into a habit for you guys. Well, I can share one funny story because you had mentioned earlier that we lived in a Malibu mansion. What it really was, was a dilapidated, very large house. And, you know, when it comes to leveling up and thinking bigger, we came to a crossroads uh, in our career, in our, in our journey, um, where we had about 20 people working at our company and we realized we needed to locate the company in Los Angeles. Um, this is around 2010. 
but we could not afford to all get houses in Los Angeles. We couldn't afford office space. And we certainly, uh, we really needed to, you know, keep building the community. And uh, we realized, you know, we certainly couldn't afford to do dinners at fancy restaurants. And so we decided to rent this like 35,000 square foot house in Malibu that was, I mean, it had orange carpet. Like it, it was literally, it was so similar to the broken down castle in Beauty and the Beast that it had a rose garden out front. Um, and like for us, and when we think about leveling up and making no small plans and thinking bigger, or going bigger, there are very practical thinking bigger steps to take that don't cost much money or take much risk. Like you should not, you know, if you've played hearts, like, you know, every like few years you, you can kind of shoot the moon, right? Uh, you should not shoot the moon every single hand, right? Because if you don't in, in hearts, uh, if, you, if you fail to shoot the moon, like you lose everything uh, basically. And so for us, a lot of our leveling up was these decisions where we need to go to Los Angeles. So how do we make this big power move of moving our company to this big city, moving our, our, our team there, building a community there, but not you know raise tons of capital, get some fancy office. And so what we did was we found this dilapidated mansion and then we started, uh, we learned this trick that you can take any crappy space. And if you turn off all the lights at night and just put lamps and candles, it looks amazing. So we would do that trick two nights a week and have like 50 people over to dinner. And it kind of became this lore that you could drive down the PCH past where all the nice houses are, you know, where Larry Ellison has his house on Carbon Beach, drive about half an hour past that. Um, and you'll see this, this big house and you'd come in and it would be totally dark except for uplighting and candles. And we started putting on these unbelievable dinners. And I think that really was the beginning of when we started creating just this like wild energy and spaces. But I came to this story, Stephen, just because it was a big uh, risk on the outside, but it was a risk we took without basically any financial risk, you know, without any reputational risk. Um, and when you think about like, how did you buy a mountain? Like, you know, that was many, many, many years into our journey. And it was, you know, methodic, we, 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 you know, methodically thought about it for many years. And so, you know, I'll end my answer and pass it to Jeff by saying most big risks you take, there is a path to take them without actually taking much risk. Definitely not will, the case I, with the Clinton talks. <laughs> the the sax auction. I will come back to about. answer the Clinton talk of after Jeff goes, I will yeah. tell you why I believe the Clinton talk was actually less risky, even though we had a quarter million dollars on the line that we didn't have. I will tell you why I think there was actually less risk than someone would assume there was. Jeff? Okay. Uh, all I would say is that, you know, we, we you don't see, uh, if you're, if you're seeking, like we were on like our Blues Brothers mission from God at a point, there's so much confirmation bias, it keeps working. And when we had all of these remarkable, you know, and, and I, I think we're really lucky to have some great partners and we all work together really well and debated ideas really well. So instead of it just being one of us, it was the four of us plus a really incredible team of people in the early days and continued on until today that, you know, truly do build Summit with us. It's, the, you know, it's a fallacy if people think that it's, you know, just us and our leadership. But I, I do think we were blessed with like a really, really great team in those early days. I'm just saying that uh, if you are searching for treasures, you'll find them. And if you're looking for amazing opportunities, you'll find them. Um, you have to be methodical and have a process and be patient and have trusted friends that will poke holes in your ideas before you decide to you know, take a big bet. But, you know, you don't get anywhere taking small bets. That's why the books make, make no small plans. You know, like, you, you, you know, that, that was the flow state we were in and like the, you know, people that we had surrounding us that we could ask for help and our willingness for, to ask for help and to be in the business of relationships and experiences, not in a transactional manner. You know, it was really about trust and friendship and fun um, and, and mutual aid. Um, you know, not, you know, making money off of one another or extracting value from one another. So um, I think it put us in a position where, you know, uh, we, 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 we would definitely egg each other on. We weren't hucking cliffs and taking stupid risks, but when we, you know, heard Powder Mountain was quietly for sale, 
it sounded insane to us too. We didn't think it was real, but did we get on a plane? Yeah, of course we got on a plane, you know? And like, did it seem insane when we were driving up to the top of the mountain? Yeah, it still was like, there's no possible way we're gonna buy this mountain, but you know, would it make, would it make the movie? Should, you know, like, can we leave it unturned? And then once you're, you know, inspired and you feel it and we saw the sunset over the Great Salt Lake and we were like really considering, okay, wow, like, can we actually do this? Is this a real possibility? Is it worth our time, our life's path, our, you know, what we've built so far underneath us? I mean, the, the amount of, like Elliot mentioned, the, the, the ideas after dinner, ideas late at night, time together, like the, the, the you know, spiral dynamics of living and working together um, in that way, um, professionally and personally, uh, you know, I think that, that that led to us always taking that big bet, but in a way where we had cycled through a hundred big bets that we didn't take. Give our listeners a little bit of context there uh, around the Clinton talk and what it was, because it was, to me, the quarter million dollars on the line was the craziest part. So we, as we were building Summit, we would have these opportunities to get big luminaries to speak. And we had a chance to get pre- we had a chance to get President Clinton to speak. And the issue with getting was getting President Clinton was that he would do the event, but he would not confirm a long time ahead without us giving a donation to his charity, right? So it was, yeah, sure, you know, you know, we could give you a few days' notice when he's in New York City or in DC and he'd love to come. But if you want to book him, you know, months ahead of time and be able to promote him, like you need to make a donation. And so we realized. Like we really need to get President Clinton and it was a quarter million dollar donation to his foundation. And like, we didn't have, like we we were making like a couple thousand dollars a month each, you know, and we were, you know, literally sharing beds with like a pillow between us. And like, we had moved to a two bedroom uh, condo for the Fork Summit co-founders. And we walked into like two bedrooms, two beds for four of us. And we literally looked at each other and said like, this is the best opportunity of our life. Like this is, this is incredible. So um, what happened with President Clinton is that on the surface, like we committed to paying him a quarter million dollars and we didn't have the money. But I think in reality at that point, what was actually happening behind the scenes is that we had sold hundreds of thousands of dollars in tickets to our events. And we knew that if we had President Clinton booked, that there were you know, a few dozen people who would pay in the five to $10,000 range to come to an event of that caliber. And so, yes, we took this big risk, but it's very different, um, you know, you know, if I were to, you know, sign a big, uh, you know, a big contract to do a, a real estate project and I didn't know anything about real estate or, you know, I signed a, a lease for an airplane, but I, I don't actually have a, an airline, right? Like for us, like we were booking Clinton, but we knew that on the back of booking him, we would be able to come up and sell tickets. And so I think just going back to risk, like I do think if one of the, just going into flow state, like when you have a team and they're always ideating, like the the best thing that happens is just the amount of ideas that come out. Like when it's me and Jeff and Brett and Jeremy and every single night, we're just throwing ideas all night, dinner ideas, after dinner ideas, late into the night ideas. And it was just basically, like that Malibu house, Stephen, it was just like nonstop idea flow all the time, constantly challenging each other, constantly pushing each other. Like it was the opposite of, uh, you know, going off to a room by yourself and saying like, I need to be in silence for four hours and I'm going to solve this thing. It was just like us in a flow state, uh, all pushing each other. You've thrown a lot of big events. I've been to a bunch of them. Was there one that was the least, well, I want to know about the least flowy event you threw, like where it didn't work and why. And uh, the corollary, the, the flowiest event you think you throw you threw and why. Yeah, I'd love to answer. I mean, the least flowy events by far are events in cities that last for an evening, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's just no time to get into a flow. And so the least flowy events that we've done you know, we did plenty of at the very beginning and realized there was no flow. So we'd stop doing them. We're just city dinners. Like there's just, it's very difficult to make a city dinner, a dinner in a city, super flowy. Um, and of the big events we did, right? Like the first event was 19 people, 60, 120, 250, 750, up until thousands of people. Um, 
you know, we would spend a year planning these and the events are three days and three nights. And when you have an experience that immersive with that much effort going into it, where people have to, you know, they, they have to literally make a pilgrimage to get there. They have to get on an airplane, basically, uh, you know, for almost everyone, they have to check into a hotel. I mean, they're very bought in. Um, you are, the harder it is to get to an event, right? The more bought in someone's going to be. It's, it's why Burning Man is so difficult to get to and you have to wait in line. I mean, that is the ultimate test of a self-selecting event, right? That any person on the planet can actually go to Burning Man, but you have to self-select in to wait in this insane line and roll in playa dust, you know, if it's your first time ever. And I think for our events, we had that same experience, you know, that same experience, but the summit way, which is, you know, you're coming to an event that, you know, is 24 hours a day. It doesn't, it doesn't stop, right? You're coming to an event where it's packed with content sessions where people are challenging your ideas. And so, um, you know, I think the events got, uh, Stephen, also got progressively much more flowy as we understood, you know, what would put people into a flow state. And I'll give one example and pass it to Jeff, but there's, when, when you want to get people into a flow state, you kind of awkwardly need to do icebreakers, either before the event or in the very beginning of the event. And, you know, a, a funny story is at Summit at Sea in 2011, um, in order to check into the boat, the check-in, we got them to move it earlier. So to, to check on the boat, you had to go through the equivalent of like customs TSA and the check-in was from 9 a.m. to midnight. And we assume like everyone would come all throughout the day. And what actually happened is everybody arrived basically at 4 p.m. because they slept in or they met interesting people the night before. And when Jeff and I got to the lobby to greet you know, the few hundred guests that had all arrived, they were in this like 90 minute long line. And these people were, were, were furious. We said like, well, how's, uh, how are you? And they're like, horrible. This is the worst event experience I could possibly have, have gotten. Like your event sucks and it hasn't started because I have to wait an hour and a half to get in. And I think like we realized in that moment, like how could we flip this? And so we literally got on our phones and walkie talkies. We had one of our DJs come down. We dimmed all the lights in the port. We brought all the food we had on the ship down. And since it was only the first couple hundred people there, the next 1,200 people that boarded, they arrived in the port, literally to a party at the port of Miami. Like imagine getting to an airport with all the lights off and a DJ outside of TSA, right? And then you're just, they, the, the next group of people that came and they said, like, this is the best check-in I've ever had in my entire life. This is the greatest <laughs> event I've ever seen. Um, and we're like, all right, go tell that to the first time. I remember people. that line from the second year. Or the, and the so, of it is, that was so what time. happened is we started realizing, we started learning how to put people in flow state. Like it never feels good to wait in line. You just, it gets you off. It's, it gets you on the, it's like getting out of the wrong side of the bed. Like what sucks you out of flow state more than like having like super bright lights and not feeling like you're welcome into a place versus like you said, on the second year, we actually planned ahead and made the DJ party at, you know, customs and, you know, customs at the port of Miami, like an actual thing like and people were like no i don't want to check in yet i want to i want to hang at the uh the customs party so like our flow state kept getting better and better and better um and, and maybe jeff you have some you know funny stories of events that you feel like what are things that that put people you know into a flow state whether it's like a powerful opening keynote where we would have like a ton of depth or it could be, you know, we would have jam rooms where people, you know, one minute are in an office and then they're coming in, they're literally at a music room, like jamming with attendees. You know, we're big in like putting workouts in the center yeah. of the lobby. Our, our greatest hit is probably uh, the long table dinner at Summit Outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, Summit Outside was a three and a half day event that we threw on top of Powder Mountain, kind of as a like unveiling party before we had built any roads or infrastructure on top of the mountain. And so we had to berm and build platforms for 750 tents and teepees and domes. And we brought a thousand people for a three and a half day camping experience where we literally like mulched the trails and brought five and a half pop-up tent restaurants and built stages in the forest and lighting installations and had pirate radios and pop-up, you know, chow mein carts at 2 a.m. And 
you know, uh, an unbelievable, unbelievable event that we like had the paint drying on when people started showing up and it sort of broke our event confirmation bias. We're behind the scenes. It was like too insane. What we, what we bit off 90 days ahead, we were like, sure, of course we can produce an event with no infrastructure on top of this mountain. Um, but experientially it was quite amazing as sort of like the capstone moment on the last day. Um, you know, everybody met in sort of the campsite area and we walked them about a mile. It was a little too far, but I think it was good that it was a little too far. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a pretty unknown John Batiste and his band and Elliot's brother, Austin Biznow and his band, Magic Giant, led like a procession of, you know, 800 people down this mountain road around this corner that they hadn't been to yet. And the campus in general was too big because we planned it when there was still snow on the ground. So we were literally like in snowmobiles being like, this should go here. We had no idea how far it was to walk. Um, so, so anyways, they had never seen this and they get around this corner and there's this quarter mile long dinner table. Um, and each, each picnic basket that every five people got had like charcuterie and wine and cheese and, and, you know, the, and their cutlery. And it had a little FM pirate radio tuned to the right radio station. And we sat like a thousand people at this dinner. We had to serve the courses with ATVs because there was no way to get, we had like the pop-up <laughs> restaurant at the top. Um, and, you know, like, I think that when you participate in an experience like that, like the, the, the self that you bring, the shared experience, like if you, like every, I don't know, it's like, at this point in our history, the level that we're playing at, these are a lot of people that have like the most amazing experiences around the world at all times. And if you put the right people in surreal, thoughtful, intentional, um, beautiful experiences, and you can use all these different mediums, the narrative of which I just expressed, I explained to you, the music, the food, the camaraderie, the last day versus the first day, all of these things like build up to that, that peak experience moment. So I do think that like, you know, that's sort of our, 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 uh, our superpower as, a, as an organization that we really, that we really tried to hone um, over our history. I think there's something, ego blocks flow, right? It gets in the way. You get your prefrontal cortex, it turns on. I always thought there was something really fun about making people clear their own dinner plates and clean up after themselves at your big fancy dinners, right? You guys served the food family styles. It was everybody just pitching in. And you made everybody clean up after themselves. And I like that. I think they're, 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 that sort of like, it, it reminds people that, hey, you're a human being and you have to clean up after yourself. You know what I mean? It like de-specializes you. Um, I always thought that was a nice touch. I think Stephen, you know, in the world that we live in, where you have total access to information. So it doesn't matter who you're sitting and watching give a speech, just like you've already heard them. So just by definition, you know, there's so, you can, you know, by definition, every famous, successful, brilliant person, you've already heard them and everything they're going to say, right? So there's just only so much you can get out of sitting in a speech, right? And I think if, if I were to look at, you know, what are the things that, you know, Summit has done over the years that have really been different, I think, to your guys' points, um, letting people co-create the events, you know, painting walls, um, painting structures, serving the dinners, cleaning up the meals, um, anything that's participatory, you know, starts to flip things upside down. Um, and, and the other thing is surprises. Again, just living in a world where there's so much communication and nothing's really a surprise. And especially uh, successful people, like everything's all planned out at special places. And so doing real surprises, like our events, you know, we've had, you know, secret passageways into content sessions that weren't on the schedules, or like Jeff said, secret buses hitting, hidden in the woods, where we just don't tell anyone. There's just, we, we tell two people, hey, at 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., there's going to be this food truck in the woods. And on the first night, only 20 people go. And on the second night, 100 people go. And on the third night, 500 people go, because they all find out about it. So th those are two of the big themes, just like constant surprises like Jeff said that dinner we didn't tell anyone what the dinner was all the only instruction was you know wear boots and show up at this point and then they didn't even they showed up an hour before dinner so first there was you know a half an hour you know dance-a-thon with John Batiste and his band and then the band started walking and everyone just started following and a mile later which took 20 minutes they looked and there was a they couldn't even tell what it was because the table was so long 
And then when they got to the seat, it actually took another 20 minutes to walk to the end of the table. And so just like constantly surprising people um, has been a big, and bringing people into the product where, you know, you're, you're not, you're part of a march, you're, you're, you're part of a dinner, you're part of the service. Um, those two things have really moved the needle for us over the years. Every couple of years, you guys have leveled up and done something bigger, something weirder, more interesting. So like, how do you, how do you continue to do that if you already bought a mountain? Like, there's a good, you- there's a good uh, story in our book um, that after we did Summit at Sea, we realized we, we were growing the community so quickly. Like what we actually wanted to do was a smaller event. And so we did, we went from an event that was about 1500 people back to an event that was 850 people. So it actually, what would be more surreal, you know, wouldn't just be more and more and more, but it would actually just be a tighter experience. And right. I think, I think, you know, with your question, like, what do we do to top a mountain um, would be to make the mountain really incredible, right? To actually build out, um, you know, now you own it, you know, now we have, you know, approaching 50 homes that are completed, building out the lodge, building out the amenities, improving the ski resort, you know, building, you know, great communication between all the neighbors. I think, you know, we took a lot of time the last two years to write write a book um, that in many ways, you know, isn't building anything forward. It's like, you know, I basically just dis- describe it. I describe it as, you know, taking the, the craziest five years of our life and these like dozens of lessons we learned and actually packaging it so anybody can read our story. And so I think like a lot of the last few years have been about taking the things we feel really fortunate to have, having Powder Mountain, being able to build it out, having stories, being able to package them. I mean, you know, we, we, we launched another company called Summit Junto, um, where, you know, which we frankly wanted to do for like half a decade, which is almost the inverse of the big event. And it's, you know, getting small curated groups of six people just, you know, and building people their own advisory boards and having those groups meet for a couple hours once a month. So I think, you know, in many ways it was, you know, looking, you know, introspectively, to tighten up the things we want. It wasn't, you know, add more community members. Like the community had grown so large. It was, you know, pull back, focus on the values of the community. Is everyone who's part of the summit community truly good, kind people? Are they all excitable, energized, you know, entrepreneurial people? Um, You know, are we serving the community in the best ways? You know, should we do smaller events, which is what we did this past fall of 2021, you know, we did these very surreal small events, you know, in, you know, rural Colorado and on Lake Powell, you know, are we giving the community like a chance to deeply connect with each other? Okay, let's launch some Agento, our forum. So I think that's the answer to your question, how Jeff and I and the team have looked at it the last couple of years. And, um, you know, maybe Stephen, now that we've looked internally, it's time to go bigger again. <laughs> Summit on the moon, folks. Summit on the moon. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd do it. Um, by the way, I have a few friends in June too who absolutely love it and rave about it, guys. So I'll throw that out there uh, and mention that to anyone who's listening as well. SummitJunto.com, is that the URL? Yeah, just summit.co. Summit.co, okay. And then Junto uh, as well. So um, Ali, you mentioned, you know, one of the reasons behind writing the book was so that people can learn and then create their own communities. And I'm curious if you guys were going to start to build a community again from scratch, what would be the sort of play by play breakdown that you would approach to, you know, create something big and impactful like you have done? Well, I think the most important thing is doing something different than exists in the world. Like, uh, and I think there's a great quote, you know, the riches are in the niches. So whether that's, you know, the riches as in, you know, money, or whether it's, you know, the metaphorical riches of success, I think there's really something to niches. And I think, you know, Summit's like core being is about serving the entrepreneur in all of us. And, you know, being an entrepreneur is glamorized, but as anyone knows who's entrepreneurial in a company or they are an entrepreneur having started their own nonprofit or band or business, it's really hard day in and day out. And so at its core, Summit is actually pretty niche. You know, Summit is not designed for anyone to come to. And it's designed that way not to be exclusionary. It's actually designed that way to attempt to include as many people as possible who are entrepreneurial, right? And so we, we've always thought that like a really powerful niche 
um, can truly service people who need, need that niche. So I, I'd love to set this up for Jeff. Um, but my first takeaway is focus on something niche. Don't focus on, I'm going to build a community for, um, you know, millennials, or I'm going to build a community for, you know, people interested in real estate, or like you need to build something really, really niche. And look, we live in a big world. And when you service a niche, people will self-select into it in a way that is more mind-blowing than you could ever imagine. Jeff? I, I, I think you're talking about like who, it's almost like a super user. Um, you could call it product market fit, but you're talking about servicing the person that's going to be totally ecstatic about what you do. Um, I don't know that we had that in mind. Like we didn't have any outcome we were seeking really with Summit out the gate other than we knew it was um, amazing for us just to meet all these other, you know, um, uh, wonderful entrepreneurs. And we saw how valuable that was to them. So if you, you know, it, it's hard to service something that's not a need, especially if it's your first time, like you need to be afflicted by the thing. So you're passionate about it. So you do it um, over dinner or late at night, or it's fun for you. Cause if it's not like somebody's probably going to smoke you at your own game, cause it's fun for them. They're passionate about it. Like it's very rare where you just have a proper operator that can be like the best in the world at something, or at least good enough to break out, forget being the best in the world at anything, like just successful, you know, like just, you know, independent enough with your own business to choose to work versus need to work. I mean, that's a lifelong battle for even the most successful entrepreneurs. So, uh, you know, I think that what, what Elliot's describing in terms of niche is like, you know, flow state, for instance, Stephen, you're, you know, you get overwhelmingly into this particular, you know, idea in a way that is like psychotic, right? That's the definition of like, <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. But that's what it takes. <laughs> no, us, true. Too, us too. We're like, we're thinking about like how to arrange the chairs around the dinner and, and how we do the box to make you clean your plate. I forgot about that until you told me. But that was the that was the thinking was like we really were um, and and uh, over the top with it and um, you know completely engaged in it at all times and then uh, I think that you know in terms of like building community not having an outcome that you're seeking for yourself is really important like you need to be thinking about giving value to those that you're trying to bring together in a way that's differentiated just sort of repeating the same thing Elliot said and you know my own words. Um, otherwise it's probably not worth their time. When we, uh, when we arrived at Powder Mountain the first time, I mean, it couldn't have been farther from any place we'd ever been. I mean, the town only has 4,000 people and it, you know, it's in rural Utah, an hour from the Salt Lake city airport. And we drove up the mountain and on the original building from 1972, that this is real on the original building from 1972, there was a sign from the founder, this guy, Dr. Kobabe. He, he was, uh, he'd started Powder Mountain, you know, in his mid fifties and he was like 98 at the time, but there was a sign on the original building and it said, welcome to Powder Mountain where you're only a stranger once. And I think we all just thought, wow, like this is, we're in a totally different, you know, place than we've ever been. We, we don't, I don't know how much we have in common, you know, with Dr. Kobabe and with Powder Mountain. And they have that view of community, right? Because Powder Mountain is the ultimate place that self-selects the people who ski there, right? Or the people, you know, self-select to ski there. Um, you know, it's not Park City. It's not Aspen. It's not filled with, you know, fancy shops and amenities, right? It's for the people who really love the outdoors and they want to, you know, look each of the lifties in the eye and say hi to the fellow skiers. And, you know, like when you're at the restaurants, like, you it's annoyingly peel. friendly. It's like oddly friendly. It's true. oddly friendly. Yeah. And I think we just saw that and we thought, wow, like that's how you build community. Right. And like, I think there's just, you can build community with millions of people, right. Who come to a place, right. You can, you know, there's like anyone who skis at Powder Mountain considers themselves, you know, um, you know, they consider themselves part of that community. And so that, that's something you know, when you apply to any community you're building, like that's how a community should feel. Like when you, you know, any community should feel that as soon as someone becomes a part of it, um, they're no longer a stranger. Um, there, there was a good quote of another community I saw that actually like Burning Man had been based on. Um, but the quote of that community was, you may already be a member, 
right? And the idea was that it was, the idea was that the community was a mind was a mindset, right? If uh, if you care about helping the next generation of um, of students in America, well, you may already be a member. If you care about you know a certain subset of music or music genre, you you may already be a member. And I I always thought you know that was funny. And I'll just end this by saying um, you know. The best, like one of the communities that that's the best to study and understand in, is Burning Man because it's cheap to attend. Anybody can go. There is no membership yet. Everyone considers themselves a member. Why? Because there's these couple things you have to do that only the the people who are so passionate about these ideals would go, and everyone else thinks it's insane. Right? You have to be into radical self sufficiency. And you have to be into radical self-exploration. And if you're not into those things, you will never, ever, ever go to Burning Man. And if you're into those things, you will shout to the world that everyone who's into those things should go. Um, and so look, Jeff and I and our team, we've spent a lot of time thinking about communities. Um, and um, you know, you've built a great community. And it's look, it's very when you when you're running, uh, leading a community, you're a steward, you are stewarding a community right? Like it is not your community. Um, and as soon as you realize that all you are is a steward of the community, um, you know, you know, I guess then your, your journey starts. And, and, and I love, I love this. I, I would, I just to add on, I, I would say most, if not, you know, not all, but most amazing thought leaders, um, uh, like to mentor and they want to give to those that, you know, can receive their knowledge it's 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 such a pleasure for the receiver and the giver, um, and you know like that that I think um, should demystify like you don't only have to go for the highest level person. That's not why people came to summit was just to meet like the titans of industry. It was the diversity of thought. It was like people that were exceptional but perhaps twenty seven years old and hadn't had their breakout hit yet. You know like we we were reading it based on. The, the, the work ethic and the energy. Sure, if we, we, we didn't have 100% read on the ideas, especially business and technology. Like, what do we know about 99% of stuff? You know, it's really about the person. And then you can see some of like the writing on the wall. Like, the, you know, they say the ball doesn't lie, right? You can check the scoreboard. Like if they build dope shit on a regular basis, if they're scaling an enterprise, if they're like an amazing CEO, if this is their third thing, like, guess what? You got a gangster on your hands. Like this person's a proper player. You know, so I think that, um, you know, the, that was the thing that we were always optimizing for. We didn't chase celebrity. We didn't chase, you know, any particular, you know, um, cheat code. We were more interested in like your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. And that's how you get me and Elliot to show up at your thing. You know, like surprise us with somebody that we already love that you didn't, we didn't think you knew about. Your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. That's a great way to sum it up. I love that. Love that, Jeff. I, I want to ask you guys about group flow between the four of you because you're, you know, the four of you have just written a book together, which means you're all presumably on on decent terms. Uh, and and Elliot, you were mentioning uh, the idea of flow. Jeff, you were kind of emphasizing almost this egging each other on to think bigger and entertain ideas like the mountain. Uh, and so I'm curious what the contributing factors were to the success um within the four of you and the the group flow that, that you four obviously experienced as well well let me let me take you back to the the time the book takes place so this book is a story from when we had zero connections zero resources zero success uh two college degrees between the four of us uh zero entrepreneurial success um and it's a story from that point until the day we buy Powder Mountain. And it's about five years. And in those five years, um, you know, there's a great line in the quote, you know, we were, you know, of how we, a, a great quote in the book um, about how we came together. Uh, we were not exactly the Beatles, um, right? It was like, first I met Brett at this really sad networking event. Like I was selling real estate ads for my dad's newsletter and Brett like, couldn't get any jobs after college. So he got a commission only real estate job, not even selling real estate, selling land. And he got the job in the 2008 real estate crash. So like he never, um, 
even sold a piece of land. And I met him at the saddest event. It was a, it was like an urban land institute, local chapter event that nobody else had, had showed up to. Like there's there only like 12 people. Um, by the way, it would turn out that when we needed to buy Powder Mountain and none of us knew like how quick, how do you buy land? Since Brett never made any sales, he just spent like two straight years learning how to buy land. Um, so, you know, what goes around comes around, which is pretty funny. And then we met Jeff who had just left, you know, finished American University. Um, and he was unhappy in his, you know, job at Macy's. And then Jeremy was in a band, um, you know, living on $8 a day. And I, I asked him, I said, like, Jeremy, how do you, uh, how do you eat on $8 a day? And, uh, he was like, well, we go to the grocery store. And I'm like, right. But like, what can you buy for $8? He's like, no, 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 no. You know, the, uh, like where the nuts are, you can just scoop. Um, we just do that for like half the meal and then the eight covers the rest. So it was like, we were a real sad ragtag bunch of guys. And like what happened immediately is that we all moved in together. And we all, I think Jeff said it earlier, like we all started pushing each other. And then we immediately divided up the roles. Like you can tell that like, I'm kind of the off the deep end, excitable one of the group. Like, you know, Jeff is incredibly thoughtful about um, the culture of Summit, the brand of Summit, um, you know, what kinds of speakers we want to book, like what's next. Like we always prided ourselves in not booking famous people, booking who's next, just like a music manager would discover who's next, right? Like Brett got really into music and Brett would lead the charge, you know, with our musical acts. Um, Brett was always really into building uh, the funnel to build a community. Um, and so he would lead kind of our sales and community efforts. Like, you know, Jeremy was the one who uh, would lead our technology and our website development and, you know, getting our registration pages built. So it's like the four of us came together uh, and immediately just got into a flow state together, like living together, breathing together, eating together, dividing up the work together. Um, and we did that for five years. And I think like our main takeaway is it's mind blowing how much we did in five years. Like it's, it's almost overwhelming because every day it was like each day had like, you know, at least three days in it. You had like the period from seven to 2 PM, you had the period from like two to 8 PM. And then at 8 PM, you're just getting going on the brainstorming sessions till 2 AM. So it's just like, I don't know. I mean, Jeff, I'd love you to chime in. It's maybe a good question to end on, but it was total flow state, like constantly challenging each other, constantly asking each other like positive, challenging questions. Um, you you want to take it away, Jeff? Yeah, we wouldn't, there was no man left behind in terms of like the personal growth and the experiences um, and the knowledge sharing. I mean, we'd go out, take meetings and we'd come back home and everybody would tell each other about their day. You know what I mean? Like we would, we would share the learnings. We were inspired by the learnings. We are insatiably you know, curious in all these different directions, most of the time that has no applicable overlap to our businesses. So it was kind of like kids at a candy shop. It's a bunch of ADHD kids that didn't really do well in college. For, you know, Brett's pretty smart in, 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 a, in a normal way. But, uh, you know, the rest of us, I think, are abnormal learners. And we need to, like, do it and be taught. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll wait until we can get an expert to guide us. And so, you know, that's what we hunt for in, like, every aspect of our lives, whether it's wellness or music or you know, content or real estate, you name the discipline that was, and if you make, if you go big, um, you know, then you, you get people that would otherwise not be, you know, interested to be a part of the thing that you're doing, you know, like it's inspiring for them too. It's valuable for them too. Um, so also ran shit is just not going to break through. It's that straightforward. Um, and it takes a lot of, you know, passion and, and, and introspection and experience. Like, I think it's more important to be prolific than to be perfect especially if you're trying to, you know, get into a flow and create from flow versus from, you know, immaculate, um, you know, realization. You're not going to be Nikola Tesla walking in the park and be like, oh shit, this is how, this is how current should work. So um, I, I, I'm a firm believer that you like, you know, lay the, the, the great wall brick by brick and it just takes 30 years to be a proper player. You know, like it takes 30 years to get value out of a relationship. So who cares like who wins on the deal? You know, like so long as everybody's happy and wants to play again, then like we can keep going. Um, and I guess that we sort of demystified these big bets to ourselves because like we would talk a ton of shit. We would joke about it. Sorry for my vulgarity. 
Um, but you know, now I'm excited about the, 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 the conversation. Um, and we'd be like, you know, this is the big dream. And then the real challenge would be like, how do you wake up and then apply sort of like the tools that we were building as executives, as entrepreneurs, as, you know, um, community builders, as strategic advisors and partners in a real and meaningful way. So we can then, you know, it's not reciprocation. It's like you give somebody the opportunity to help you. People want to help you, you know, especially when they're getting a lot of value um, and inspiration from the relationship and the experiences that you provide for them. So we sort of just like, I don't know, I guess we kind of hacked the system for ourselves. Um, so we could, you know, we, we were kind of forced to go off the deep end um, in a way. <laughs> Super guys, love it. Yeah, appreciate the time. This was, this was a blast. Uh, and I just want to emphasize to everyone to get the book. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be disappointed reading it. Make No Small Plans, Lessons on Thinking Big, Chasing Dreams and Building Community. Uh, and then summit.co.co uh, and then Summit Junto. Uh, which is at, I think it's summit.co forward slash Junto, J-U-N-T-O is definitely worth checking out for everybody as well. So thank you guys a ton. It's been a blast. Thank you guys. Jeff, oh. Elliot, pleasure seeing you guys again. Thank you both. And love the book. Thanks. See ya. See you guys. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, Please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 